Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's time for the next session to begin. And Steve Sorensen is here to uh, speak about things he has learned about Francis Marion Lyman. Uh, Steve has a wonderful background in this arena. And I'd like to mention first, uh, broadly, that he is a great-great-great-grandson of Amasa Mason Lyman through Francis Marion and his daughter, who was Ellen Taylor Lyman. Steve was a, is a native of Salt Lake City, and he graduated from the University of Utah Law School and practiced law in Salt Lake City for about 35 years. For most of the time, he worked in the United States Attorney's Office, where he served as first assistant for a long time, and acting U.S. Attorney for a short time. He retired in 2016, and he has been working on a biography of Francis Marion Lyman. Uh, out in the hall on my display table is his first draft of half of the book. He has since completed another uh, two-thirds of the second half of the book, and he has eight chapters he's hoping to get written um, before it's complete in his mind, what he had set out to do. I know that Steve set out to capture a much broader history of Francis Marion Lyman than shows up in the Albert R. Lyman book. And that that's needed because, for one thing, the Albert R. Lyman book was highly edited, cut down to be more readable by Melvin Lyman, and also because there is uh, much more information available now than was available back when Albert R. wrote. I also want to mention that Steve uh, served as mission president in a Russia mission. Which one was it? Moscow? The, the Moscow mission for three years, and it was when he came back from that mission five years ago that he gave his first presentation about Francis Marion Lyman, and so this is a follow-up from five years ago. Steve, thank you so much for coming. We're very happy to have you today, and wish you the best in your presentation. Thanks, Dave. Um, Great to be here, and I really appreciate all who work so hard to put this great uh, expo together every five years. Let me apologize for my voice. I'll try and keep it up, but boy, it's not what it once was. So if you can't hear me, give me one of these, will you? Or raise your hand, or we'll try and, try and keep it uh, uh, audible anyway. They mentioned my uh, connection with Amasa Lyman, and then with uh, Francis Marion Lyman. Uh, Marion's daughter, he was called Marion by members of the family and friends, so if I say Marion, I mean Francis Marion Lyman. Uh, Marion's second daughter was Nellie, who died when she was about 20 of uh, tetanus after an infection when she had some dental care. And she left two little boys, age two and six months. The two-year-old was Stanley, who was my grandfather. His daughter was Jeanette, who was my mother. So we tie in, uh, tie in that way. I want to mention, for sure, uh, any time you undertake a study of Francis M. Lyman, you're immediately indebted to about uh, three people, especially one, of course, is Albert Lyman. Uh, Francis, or Francis Marion, was one of the great uh, diarists of the church. There, he kept a great journal, about 40 volumes of it. It's not currently available to private researchers, but uh, Albert, when he wrote his biography of Francis M. Lyman, had the journals. So the, the quotations we have from uh, Marion's journals are from courtesy of uh, Albert Lyman, both his published version, and then there's a partial longer draft in BYU Special Collections uh, area. 
And those are the direct quotations we have currently of Marion's journals. I should say, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly the day will come when it's the time is appropriate and it uh, will become permissible for private researchers to have greater access to those journals. In the meantime, um, uh, this biography I'm working on, I think, will be an interim uh, solution. There is much more material available now than Albert had, and so for our descendants, I felt it was important to have that compiled in one, or much of it compiled in one location. My target audience, or target readers, frankly, are my grandchildren. Not now, but in 20 or 30 years, when they pick up a book and want to read about uh, Marion Lyman, Francis M. Lyman, that the information will be there. And then the real crown of uh, the biographies of Francis M. Lyman will be when the, someday when the journals are available for private research and some top-notch historian who can tell a good story from a vast amount of material puts together. That's, that's the one you'll want to pay attention and, and see, but I don't know when that will come. So in the meantime, we're working on this. I mentioned two or three people we're grateful for. Albert uh, first, Leo Lyman second, of course, who has done such an incredible amount of work and preserved so much of family history. And the third I wanted to mention is Scott Partridge, late Scott Partridge, who compiled uh, and, and enabled to be published uh, Amos's diaries. Well, let me give you a short uh, recap of the life of Francis M. Lyman. Much of it you already know. Maybe a few of the things that I talk about today you won't have, uh, have heard. Francis, or Marion, as he was called, was born in 1840 as his family was fleeing from, or traveling from Missouri to Illinois uh, in a place that had no name at that point, soon came to be called Good Hope, uh, Illinois. Uh, he grew up in the pioneer period. It was his dad's oldest son, and if ever a father uh, molded and shaped the character of a son for the good, it was Amos Lyman and his son Marion. And I'll talk about that more in a moment. Uh, Am or more, yeah, Marion rather was was a big boy. Uh, he uh, and he came and became a big man, and that uh, ended up being very advantageous for him. At home, uh, let me give you a couple of quick descriptions. This was when he was uh, patriarch of a larger family. One of his uh, uh, granddaughters-in-law wrote this. He was a very affectionate man to his family. I've never seen him sit down to the ta dinner table without his coat, no matter how hot. Not go around the house without it. He was aristocratic and refined, was excellent company and very jovial. Uh, another description from B.H. Roberts who was a young man called to the uh, First Council of Seventy and whom Marion sort of took under his wing and mentored. Uh, uh, Elder Roberts wrote, uh, I met Apostle Francis M. Lyman, my friend and brother. He was pleasant to meet me and it, was, it is always a pleasure for me to be in his company. Brother Lyman is a large man standing fully six feet and of heavy build, he weighs between, he weighs about 240 pounds and has weight as high as 280. He is of a light, ruddy complexion. He has a light blue eye, rather severe in his expression. Noble presence, gives way to no light-mindedness. Strictly obeys the word of wisdom and is strictly enjoins it upon others. One of the pleasant things of this trip has been to witness the love that all of the relatives of Brother Lyman have for him. Surely he is a prince in his father's house. I think that description would have uh, very much pleased Francis M. Lyman. Uh, when he grew up, when he was growing up, I mentioned the influence that Amasa had in his life. 
Let's go to the next. Uh, these are in no special order. There's a more familiar picture, perhaps, of Francis. Go to the next. His father, Amasa, of course, and Mariah Louisa. Next was his mother. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Uh, as in those tumultuous times, as Marion grew up as a boy, he was his dad's right-hand man. He, the first important job he had when he was six years old was to tend a span of two oxen while they were traveling to winter quarters. The only thing he couldn't handle was putting that big yoke on the oxen in the morning and taking it off. Oh, thank you. Taking it off in the evening. Otherwise, he walked every step of the way to the left of the oxen, seeing that they stayed in line. I think that gave him uh, a positive outlook that lasted his lifetime on work and on helping others. I think it was pleasing to him to uh, be physically able to help and to please people and find them surprised that he could help beyond his apparent ability, but he really could. One of his dad's uh, teachings in his letters, I'd like to mention for just a moment, and the letters between, over the years, between Amasa and Marion and vice versa, are so choice. They're wonderful. The one, one statement Amasa made in a letter in 1855, but had made several times through the years, was be studious to learn those things that will enable you to extend the sphere of your usefulness. Marion, through his life, was always on the alert for ways to extend the sphere of his usefulness. This uh, picture is from an old Desert News article in about 1909, but Alyssa is age uh, 35 and Marion is age 13, and this was about the, I think about the time they were going down to San Bernardino. Marion, in that experience, became a very good uh, teamster, very good, uh, uh, what do you call some anyway, a bronco buster, but uh, mule skinner, yeah, teamster. And uh, uh, was strong with that, made, made the trip, 17 or so round trips between San Bernardino and Salt Lake, which, as Leo has written, is one of the very most difficult trails in the, in the history of the American West. But Leo, or pardon me, not Leo, uh, Marion as he grew, cherished his good health. He really had excellent health most of the time. And I think he loved it because then he was able to, to find ways to serve and things to do. So, for example, in, uh, in 1871, so he would have been 31 years old, he wrote, my health was never better. I weigh 225 pounds and could tip over a small house. <laughs> and a year later, two years later, he wrote, uh, now I will tell you what is the matter with me. I feel so well I can hardly hold still. I think it is the same complaint I've been troubled with so long. And then a year after that, he wrote, uh, my health is buoyant, never felt better. I feel as though I could run through a troop and leap over a wall. So he appreciated that, uh, that physical stature, big man, but also good health, and he used it to, to try and help other people. One example has to do with dentistry. I'm just curious, how many of you have ever had a real toothache in your life? Yeah, how was it? That's terrible. Uh, I had one when I was a little kid somehow, and I remember it still. It's just an awful way. So in 1880, when uh, Marion was called as a member of the Twelve, dental care consisted of dentures if you had enough money or were in one of the eastern big cities. But otherwise, if you had a toothache, the solution was having that thing yanked. And it hurt so bad that you really wanted someone to do it. Marion, as he went around visiting the settlements, noticed the number of people who really were struggling 
with bad teeth. So he went and bought himself a set of dental tools and offered to extract teeth if people needed it. So at the conferences, a discreet announcement would be made at the beginning that uh, Elder Lyman will be available after the conference to extract teeth for those who, who need it. Usually speakers are pulling teeth in another symbolic sense, but and afterwards, uh, either outside the chapel on the lawn or in somebody's home, they'd line up and uh, and uh, Frank Marion would uh, would help them by pulling that terrible tooth. Um, Marion estimated at the end by the what twenty or so years he was pulling teeth, he probably pulled about 5,000 teeth. So he did well. Um, they weren't limited to, the services weren't limited to congregations either. He wrote this, we passed through Kadara, Hamilton, Cedar City, and on to Johnson's Fort, where we stopped overnight. The next morning in the gray light, we were warming up by the fire in the Teamsters room. When I noticed my friend Ivory making a wry face and enveloping his jaw with his two hands, he was moaning for someone to pull his tooth. I don't think it took me more than two minutes to get my satchel out, to snatch my forceps, and to yank out his aching molar. This made him happy. When he asked me for the bill, I told him the pleasure I took in hurting him was ample pay for all my trouble. <laughs> and that he might call on me any time for the same kind of job at the same price. Anyway, uh, one example, Marion wanted to help people. Another way was his mentoring. And really significantly over his life, he had a, an urge and a desire to reach out and help younger people, younger men especially, who were um, struggling with a new position or struggling with lifestyle choices. Uh, Richard Lyman, his oldest son, wrote after Marion's death, uh, father could give uh, advice for a minute, that was sound, or he could give good advice for two days. And he really could. You read the letters to, uh, whether it's to a teenage granddaughter or a son who's just returned from a mission, or uh, a grand, his first grandson going into the mission field. He gives great advice, and it's not just the same pablum over and over again. It's uh, every sentence is a really sound piece of advice. It's quite amazing. When Heber J. Grant uh, was a young man, he was called as president of the Tuella Stake. He took uh, Marion's place as stake president and Marion really helped him and brought him along and traveled with him. And uh, President Grant said later on what a valuable thing that was in his life. Years later, um, when uh, Marion was finished being president of the European mission, Heber J. Grant was his replacement. And similar uh, circumstance, in fact, uh, Elder Grant wondered a little if uh, President Lyman had forgotten that Elder Grant had now been a member of the Corps of the Twelve for about 20 years and didn't need quite so much instruction. But his, his good advice uh, apparently included a daily health and exercise regimen. Heber J. Grant at that point was concerned for his health, always had trouble sleeping past three or four in the morning. Uh, Elder Lyman recommended a daily breathing exercise, 100 deep breaths, kneading his stomach for five minutes, kneading spelled with a K, kneading your stomach. Then performing 15 minutes of mild calisthenics to stretch and tone his muscles. And finally, a compensating nap after lunch. Elder Grant adopted this program and followed it for the rest of his life. Uh, Marion was anxious to help uh, however, however he could. Let's go to the, oh, yeah, let's go to the next. This is uh, Marion on his second mission. The three men on the front row are John Henry Smith, his good friend, who was called to the Quorum of the Twelve the same day. Joseph F. Smith, six years older, but 
still a great lifelong friend, who was then to serve as the mission president, and Francis M. Lyman, who was returning for his second mission to England. As you know, he had three wives, and I think it was Jed yesterday morning who said, the wives are really the unsung heroes. That's always the case, and certainly was the case with uh, Marion. His first uh, wife, Rhoda Ann Taylor, from Australia, they were married uh, quite young, they were all 17. Uh, Leo mentioned, I think, yesterday that uh, Marion had picked up a smoking habit from his very young teamstering years and trying to get rid of it, but hadn't kicked the habit at that point. And Rhoda's mother didn't think a lot of uh, her daughter marrying this, this uh, fellow. So they finally gave her an ultimatum. She accepted it as a fait accompli and went ahead, but then soon she and the rest of the family went back to Australia. She was a faithful Latter-day Saint, but they just a faithful Latter-day Saint someplace else. So Rhoda was the wife of Marion's youth. Uh, his other two wives were both Collisters from Fillmore. Their dad was uh, Thomas Collister, Marion's good friend, who Thomas was a bishop and I think stake president here for a long time. Uh, Marion married Clara, the older girl, when she was about 19, and Susan, the younger girl, when she was about 21. The problem, well, it's not a problem, it's just the situation. Marion's age, though, continued to advance. So he was the same age as Rhoda. He was about uh, 10 years older than Clara and about 20 years older than Susan when they were wed. But he was the father of 21 children and uh, did, uh, did a good job providing. The issue came up over time of Amos's ability to provide for all eight of his households. And it occurs to me the, the advantage that Marion had over his dad in that way was uh, Marion wasn't called as a general authority until he was 40 years old. Now he was plenty busy before that. He was going on two missions. Uh, his community service and political service in the territorial legislature, he was just busier than a one-armed paper hanger. He was doing a lot of things, but he had the discretionary time and the ability to get businesses going and learn how to make some money and get to a pretty good financial footing uh, for himself and his families. And then when the full-time call came, he was able to continue to, to provide in a reasonable way. Poor Amasid uh, never did anything but missionary work and had to then catch his catch can between missions and try and, try and provide. Now speaking of uh, Amasid and Marion, uh, I, I mentioned the, the great impact that Amasa had in his son's life. And that, that can't be overstated. Amasa seemed to have a feeling that, uh, and he did to a greater or lesser extent, I'm sure, with his other sons, but that this was the son who would carry on the work and needed or, or had the opportunity to be uh, schooled and instructed as kind of an apprentice. And uh, they were very close helped each other out. I think they started a mill here together in Fillmore at one point. Uh, if you're Marion, what do you do when your dad leaves the church? It was a crushing blow uh, to Marion. Again, as, as Leo mentioned yesterday. But uh, there are a couple of the uh, just one point I'd like to make about that that I think is, is really worth taking from, from Marion's life. Um, fo focusing in on the uh, time sort of late in the process for Amazon, when he's not only been excluded from the quorum, 
He's been excommunicated and he announces now that he's going to start preaching again, but it will be on behalf of the Gandhiites, the new movement. Uh, in 1870, uh, Amos went to Salt Lake, paid a courtesy call on President Young, conferred with a couple of the new movement leaders, then had a meeting with William Clayton, his son-in-law, and his oldest son, Marion, and announced the news that he would now be, in effect, proselyting, or at least preaching, for another faith, for a splinter faith. Well, what do you think the reaction was? Uh, Amos, uh, later recounting the uh, meeting, said it gave them much pain. We can understand that. Marion later related, he was brokenhearted and speechless. With tears in his eyes, he remonstrated with his father to no effect. He and Rhoda retired to a room at a friend's home where they, quote, wept for hours. Father's death would have been a pleasure compared with what we suffered at this terrible announcement. Uh, Amasa gave an account in a letter to Mariah Louisa uh, that I think is very interesting. And there's a, a good contrast here to be drawn and I think a good lesson for us all maybe to be learned. He tells uh, Mariah that he's made the announcement this I have announced to Brother Clayton and Marion, the former of whom, the son-in-law, denounced me and declared it made me an eternal made an eternal separation between us, between him and me. Then he goes on. Marion was deeply touched, but said he could said he should ever love and respect his father. I did not ask him to embrace my views, but, uh, but act honestly up to the views he, he entertained, and the future would give him light to see differently. Marion promised to look after my interest in the mill and stock. And the point there to be made, I think, is despite that big shock uh, that must have been cataclysmic, personally, Marion always remained loyal to his dad. And he always remained loyal to Brigham Young. Quite remarkable that you could do both, but he did it. There was a period maybe in the correspondence when the letters became a little more formalized, a little, a little stiffer and limited sometimes to just business. But that passed. And when uh, Amasa, in late years, retired to Fillmore, Marion was with him as much as possible. The other siblings were too and were supportive. Uh, at the end, when it was clear Amasa was soon to die, Marion and Rhoda spent a lot of time with him, as, as the others did, I'm sure, too. Uh, Marion left this account. Uh, a couple of visits earlier, Amasa had shared with him how he wanted his property divided uh, and said he didn't want to make anybody rich, but uh, asked Marion to take his gold watch as a keepsake. Then, uh, the, talking about the last visits, um, Marion wrote this afterwards. I promised that I would use my influence for the good of each branch of the family, and I would set such an example before them as would be worthy of imitation. We blessed each other and wept in each other's arms. He asked me how long I was going, <clears throat> excuse me, going to stay with him. Uh, I answered that I did not know and asked in turn how long he wanted me to stay. And he said, forever. So, 
somebody lets you down, your, your wonderful father, whom you've tried to model your life after, goes off on what must have seemed like the deep end. This, nonetheless, he stood your father, and you treat him that way. And he always did. His brother Lorenzo, uh, Cornelia's son, who with Henry, his younger brother, was orphaned, I think uh, Lorenzo was about age 14. The correspondence between them over the years is, is great. Lord Lorenzo, as he got old enough, decided this was not for him, this Utah Mormon business, and moved to California. Wonderful, affectionate letters where Marion was trying to persuade him and invite him back and point out the the truth of things, Lorenzo made another decision and went another way. But that didn't matter. Uh, through the years, they kept up a wonderful correspondence, respectful of each other's views and willing to be respectful, but also to have each his own views. So that uh, literally two months before Marion died, he wrote his last letter to Lorenzo, and it's uh, several pages, newsy, kind brotherly letter. Let's, let's go to the next. Ah, the territorial pen. You know that uh, episode, Marion, of course, is the fellow in street clothes. Why do you think he's in his street clothes? He didn't have one big enough. Didn't, one, didn't have a suit big enough for him. So they gave him a cap. He has his cap, and they requested still that he didn't want any special treatment, so they finally got the suit large enough, and in later pictures he shows up in his prison garb. Okay, let's go next. Uh, you may have heard that Francis M. Lyman dedicated some lands for the preaching of the gospel. While he was European mission president in 1901 to 1904, he traveled to Palestine. Now that had already been dedicated had dedicatory prayers from apostles a couple of times and what a couple of additional times after the Marians, uh, and also dedicated Finland and Russia and Poland for the preaching of the gospel. Why do we suppose that was so? Did he just like to travel and want his years in Europe and see the Holy Land? Well, no. When uh, President uh, Lorenzo Snow sent his call letter, the first presidency did. He uh, made this statement. This is when Marion was called as European Mission President. Uh, it shall become your duty to several items. One of them is, as the Lord shall open the way, seize any new opportunities which may present themselves for the introduction of the gospel to the regions where it has not yet been preached. So about a year into the mission, he had a dream about Palestine. President uh, Marion did. President uh, Snow and then, by then, President Smith, Joseph F. Smith, were in Jerusalem uh, conferring over some thorny problem. And eventually, uh, Marion steps forward and asks, can I help? And they say, well, yes, we didn't want to wear you out by doing this. So um, they set uh, a uh, not a voyage, uh, what, not a trek, uh, expedition, that's it. Uh, Sylvester Q. Cannon is the young mission president of the Netherlands, and Sylvester has the advantage of speaking French and German fluently. So Marion sends him a letter saying, come on up here, we're going, we're traveling to Egypt. So Sylvester, Sylvester takes a set of great photographs that he puts in an album. These are um, Sylvester's captions, but it gives you a flavor for that uh, journey. So here is uh, at Giza Pyramids in Cairo. Of course, in the Egyptian desert, you would never think of taking off your coat and tie and <laughs> pull it out. So Sylvester on the left, Fran or Marion on the right. And here is the Alabaster Mosque in Cairo. Next. 
Golden Gate and the Jerusalem Wall, the Marians standing there. Yeah, and here is uh, the Hill of Calvary, Calvary or Golgotha, with Sylvester and Marian standing on the side of the proximal side of the crucifixion. They were looking for an appropriate place for dedicatory prayer, and eventually. Uh, Marian gave about three separate dedicatory prayers in Palestine at different places. On the Mount of Olives, they were looking for a place, and about the best place they could find was a grove of cypress trees. So this one is uh, captioned Place of Prayer, Mount of Olives. I assume that's referring to the place where they prayed rather than the uh, Gethsemane, or it would indicate that more clearly, but anyway, place of prayer on Mount Olives. Next. On route to Haifa with Mount Carmel in the rear, on Mount Carmel they gave another, or Mary had to, gave another dedicatory prayer. And finally, Sea of Galilee, one of my favorites. Uh, Marion is there on the right end he finally has taken off his hat, but his coat and tie seem to be still in, in place, even on the sea of Galilee. Okay. Now, a year later, um, Tsar Nicholas in Russia, under pressure, uh, issued a religious freedom decree, which gave some hope that the land of Russia and its satellites may be opening up for preaching the gospel. So after conferring, corresponding repeatedly with the First Presidency and with their complete blessing, uh, Marion took a second expedition. Uh, the first was to Finland, which then was a Grand Duchy within the Russian Empire, gave the dedicatory prayer there. Then came back and with Joseph Cannon this time as his companion, traveled to um, St. Petersburg, Russia, which then was the capital. This is a painting, but really very accurate of the scene when uh, Francis Marion Lyman is dedicating the land of Russia. The summer garden, as you see in here, is still very much the same, looks just nearly identical today. The only slight uh, um, Difficulty is that the count said they sat on, sat on a bench for the prayer and they're standing here, but otherwise it's it's very accurate. Then three days later he traveled to Moscow, which although it wasn't the capital, was still the great commercial center of Russia, and stood, uh, uh, the count says, 75 feet, or 75 yards, north of the Trinity Gate, grove of trees where the mob used to be. I'm sure the appearance has changed since then, but this is the current appearance. Uh, Kremlin Wall is still there. So this was just outside the Kremlin Wall in about that location. And the Trinity Gate is still there, so if you pace off uh, 75 yards, this is where you come. So this was the approximate location for that, uh, for that prayer. Well, Francis Marion Lyman had a, uh, a big, Buoyant, a buoyant, happy life. So went through some hard times uh, as a youth, uh, kicking smoking, for one thing. Later on, uh, lived through the whole polygamy, anti-polygamy crusade, spending some time with President Cannon in the territorial pen and being in the underground for about four years. And then the period of adjustment and learning after the manifesto, but before the second manifesto, when there were still questions about, can we do this in Canada and Mexico, just not in the United States? Uh, yeah, we understand we're not, we agree not to contract new, uh, new plural marriages, but I'll be blasted if that means I'll abandon my old families. Well. Some of the people in Congress didn't have quite that understanding. And some of the 
when he was president of the Quorum of the Twelve, it was a divided quorum in some ways until that got worked out. So he, he knew how to weather, half, weather stormy uh, seas, but he did that with great, uh, great success. Well, we have a few minutes for questions if you'd like, and if you don't, we can get an early jump on lunch. So, any questions? Yes. Oh, I, uh, there are three cities in Utah, Francis, Marion, and Lyman. Do you know anything about the main origins of those cities? Uh, good, good question. And Leo Lyman is the man to ask about that. I understand that the Lyman in, is there Lyman in Wyoming? I think that's named after Marion. Somehow, the Lyman in Utah is either after Amazon or some other, maybe after Platt, I don't know. But, but I'm sorry I don't know that better, but Leo knows. Leo knows everything, so track him down. Yes? Yes, uh, as far as I know. Could you repeat the question? Oh, yes. Relationship between Marion and Richard R. Lyman. Richard R. was Clara's son, um, Mary Lyman's oldest son. With Mariah Loisey, he had girls, and then Francis Mary Lyman Jr., and then other girls. But his oldest son was uh, uh, Clara's oldest boy, Richard. I think they had a wonderful relationship together. Um, during um, Marion's lifetime, he lived to see this big strapping smart son of his uh, go back and study at the University of Michigan and uh, there and elsewhere get the uh, advanced engineering degrees and help build the what, Grand Cooley Dam and other great projects. So, and after, after his death, after Marion's death, uh, Richard wrote a great tribute for the, I think, the Young Women's Journal about his dad. That's a very, very great source of, uh, of information and feeling about Marion. I'm not aware of any division between them. And do you know? I mean, am I missing? Do you know anything that I'm missing on that? Marion died in 1916, and I think Richard was called to the quorum in about 1918. They didn't serve, their service didn't overlap, but it was soon after. And then Richard, I believe, had served for about 25 years on the quorum when he uh, left, or was invited to leave. Uh, I have a soft spot myself for Richard R. Lyman. My mother's father, Stanley, my grandfather, died young and left his wife a widow with six little children from varying ages to raise. And uh, Marion Lyman and Rhoda to this now widowed granddaughter-in-law were so wonderful, so helpful. And Richard was helpful. So my mom was, I think, 11 at the time, and as she through a couple of years, everybody was just trying to help out somehow and help uh, their mom to survive in those days when there wasn't a, much of a safety net. So um, President Lyman, I think, stopped my mom on the street and asked if, uh, meaning Richard Lyman, 
on, on the street and asked if she would like to work part-time in his insurance office. She had dropped out of high school to help the family, but I think had gone to some classes, the night classes at LDS Business College. So she said sure, and he was impressed enough with her that when one of the openings for the secretary for the Quorum of the Twelve opened, he suggested her, and to her delight and wonderment, she got the job. In those days, believe it or not, when she hired on, there was one secretary for all of the Twelve, and after a couple of years, they expanded it to two. But for many years, Mom and Pearl Bridge were the secretarial corps for the Quorum of the Twelve, and that and that was a great uh, life-saving experience for the family, for her to be able to provide. And it was all due to Richard Lyman's kindness. So he he was a great man in so many ways. Yes. Is this the only three generation apostles in the church that you know about? Not the only one, but it's one of the few. Uh, George A. Smith's son was John Henry Smith, whose son was George Albert Smith. Am I correct in that? I think that's right. Are there any others? I don't know of any other three-generation sets. Uh, yes? Can you shed any light on why the journals are still not available for research? No. Uh, yes, could I shed any light on why the journals are not uh, available for research, uh, there, I suspect that they're so meticulously kept that he included both a lot of family things, which wouldn't need suppression, but a lot of confidential Quorum of the Twelve minute type things. I think that's become less pressing with the release of some other apostolic journals from the, the period. But Marion may have kept, may be a victim of his own thoroughness, he may have kept a, a good enough record that they haven't been willing just to open the floodgates. Now they may be, I mean, you're aware that uh, President George Q. Cannon's uh, journals are now online and they've, they've redacted some things in a limited way that, that had to be, but one of these days, Trust me, they'll review that again. Uh, during the, 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 when I was starting this this project, and Dave Busseth has been so supportive and wonderful. We wrote a letter to uh, Brother Turley and Elder Snow, who will speak to us uh, as the closing speaker and the First Presidency. The journals are now out of the First Presidency vault in the history department may still need to get first presidency approval to, <laughs> to get out of those. So we made our request. I thought we were both persuasive and humble and compelling, didn't you, Dave? It's a wonderful letter. It was wonderful. Yeah. And uh, they, they took it under consideration for seven months and then sent back and said, we have your request, your request is denied all the best to you. So, I don't know, just assuming there are still some things thought to be sensitive, but we live in a good era for things now to be disclosed, or not disclosed, but opened up more. And one of these days, um, some bright young historian, or maybe set of historians, would want to take that on, that project on and do what they've done with George Q. Cannons, maybe. So that's a long, I could have said, I could have just said no. Could have. <laughs> Steve. Yes. Could you comment on your sister's youngest brother a little? Your mother's youngest oh. brother, I mean. I am my sister's youngest brother. That's right. <laughs> well, um, Jeanette, my mother, was the um, third child in their family. Third of seven, one had died when her husband died. And Elder Hanks, Mary D. Hanks, was the youngest in the family. So, and, and he, that's where the name Marion comes from, of course. He was named after his dad's beloved grandfather. And frankly, he always disliked the name Marion because it's one of those names that can be a boy or a girl. So he'd be, uh, 
you know, there'd be a substitute teacher and they'd be going down the road and say, uh, Miss Hanks, and there'd be laughter. So he didn't, he didn't like Marion as a name, uh, and always went by his middle name, but, but that's, the, that's the connection with Elder Hanks and uh, Francis Marion Lyman. I guess technically that's a fourth generation, even though it's a separate line. Oh, yeah, if you're talking just general authorities. Well, it skips a, does that skip a generation? Richard was yeah. his. Yeah, it skips a generation. So, anyway. Yeah, why don't we see what we've got? And uh, President Lyman in the mission field with a group of missionaries. He's in the middle. Go ahead. Another group of missionaries. Go ahead. Uh, this is the slide you saw earlier of Mariah Eliza and her surviving children. She's in the middle, and Marion on the left. Next. Here are three family group pictures. Marion with Clara, although Clara has passed on his picture in the inset, and their children. And next, Marion and Susan, who is on the right, and Susan's mother is in the picture. And Marion and Susan's children. And this is a picture from about 1910. This is uh, Anton H. Lund's Pierce Arrow. And they're all going for right, and I, I understand that this for a long time was the only Pierce Arrow in Utah. But you can pick out uh, uh, Amasa sort of in the not Amasa, Marion sort of in the middle in the front, and John Henry Smith and President Lund is in the rear and so on. So I think that. Uh, about wraps it up. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you said that when uh, when Marion stood proxy for grandfather, do you comment on that in your book with any? When when Marion stood proxy for his father, you yeah. mean? Did I hear the question right? Well, the question is, are you treating that in your book? I haven't yes. seen much written about that other than the past. About the restoration of Amazon's blessings. Um, I, I take this approach generally. I talk about, within the ring limits of space, all the good things Amazon did with his son and that his son knew about it generally. I don't tackle the question toward the end why why Amasa acted as he did. That's been handled by uh, Leo and uh, Lyman Platt and a lot of other people better qualified than I am. I do um, uh, provide a background briefly of Amasa's activities because I think it's necessary to know what was going on so we can assess Marion's reaction to things which is valuable, but so I deal with it, but not, not in any groundbreaking way. And then later on in 1909, I, I do talk about uh, the decision finally. Uh, Marion raised it several times over the years. Uh, President Woodruff was encouraging, but it wasn't time yet. President Snow was encouraging, said Amasa will be all right, but chose not to do it. And finally with Joseph F. Smith, it was done. So we do talk about what we know about that or what we're able to find out. Did Francis Marion write about it? Well, he probably did in his journal. But that will be a good page to turn to when we can when we can see that. Uh, I think my off-the-cuff recollection is he wrote a couple of letters and said how pleased he was, what a great blessing. And Anton H. Lund, I think, in his journal said Marion was just buoyant. He, he's about the happiest man in town today. But the, the journal will tell more, I think, about Marion's own reaction to it. Yes? So do you, do you know anything about the circumstances of this picture? Was it in with Platt? Oh, yes. We put that in intentionally. Um, Marion, when he was called as European Mission President, took the place of his brother, Platt Lyman. 
So this is Platt's last or presidency at the time he was released. Platt was the president. This counts as uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> wrong description. This is this is uh, I think Francis M. Lyman Jr. We do have a picture in the book of Platt and his counselors, and I was thinking that was this one. But this, I believe, is Marion and Rhoda, and her only son by. No, this is. This is not. That's you haven't even got a picture of uh, Rhoda Ann Taylor and her family. Yes, we do, we will in the book. We don't in this collection for some reason. But I think I intended to, and then. That's Rhoda, right? That is Rhoda. That's Marion. That's and you haven't got a picture of Rhoda Ann Taylor's family. Right. Not in, not in this. All these daughters. My father was the only son in that family. Francis M. Lyman, Jr. Francis Marion, Jr. Is that him? No. Okay, so this is, this is Platt. That's Platt B. Good, good to know. All right. So this is Platt, uh, but... We have one someplace that we're going to put in of Mary, then with Marion. She is uh, Francis Marion and Rhoda Ann Taylor. Right. Had all daughters except my father, who is Francis Marion Jr. Jr., sure. Absolutely. And we have some of the correspondence between Marion and his son, your grandfather. Yes. Was there a question? Okay. I think there's one over here. Oh, just sorry. A, just a quickie. Um, yeah. Francis was president of Quorum 12 for 14 years or something. Right, 13. Mm -hmm. Maybe you saw this. I, I read once, I'm sure, that he called David on the 12. He, did, uh, he didn't call him, but he sustained him. In those days, some of the sustaining of new apostles, they allowed, they allowed to be done by assigned members of the quorum. So he happened to be the one who presented David O. McKay, George F. Richards, Orson F. Whitney as members of the Quorum of the Twelve for the first time. Does yes, that make sense? Other question. You bet. There was a big meeting a year before the Salt Lake Temple was dedicated, and I think Prince Marion was the one that challenged the saints to have it ready within a year. Is that he, he presented the resolution that a year from today, it was laying the capstone on the, so the exterior was done, but there was still a lot of work to do on the interior to make it ready. And Francis M. Lyman was the one who presented the resolution, which was apparently unanimously adopted, that we'll get busy and get this done in a year from today. And they did. That's right. Yeah. I know we're out of time, Steve, so. There's one more question right here. Steve? One yes. Right oh, here. yes. Sorry. I was wondering why. And tell me your grandfather's name again. Joseph, uh, just because of the constraints of time. There are a lot of important parts of the story that we just didn't have time to talk about, but hopefully will be addressed or touched on in the book. I know it's a it's a curse. It's, no, I wish I had Leo Lyman's voice. <laughs> and when might, might we expect that book? Um, I think I've got about another year to go on it. I, I hope to have it done for this one, and I had some health problems along the way that delayed. But I think there'll be 45 chapters. I've written 36, all subject to a final edit, so about nine more chapters. Uh, the current intent, I don't know what form, it might be available in the, it'll be up to the publication committee. They might be able to make it available on a disc or under the tech, with the technology. I don't know if you can do a link someplace for that. Just buy it. We just need to know. <laughs> or we're, at, at least we're um, going to print some with the BYU Press. So depending on how the publication committee feels, maybe a call can go out if any are interested in the hard copy. Uh, it doesn't appear at this point, although the door isn't entirely closed, but I don't think a commercial 
publisher is going to want to do this, frankly. So that's fine. We'll make it available in other other ways, but at least a year, I'd say. Okay. Thank you. Let's, let's give Steve a hand. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, Steve and, and I have worked to uh, just explore the possibility of getting it published, a Deseret book and a signature book, and so far we're not getting a, uh, a bite from those places, but he's been working very hard. He's my father's first cousin, which is how uh, I know him. I grew up with him going to Hank's family reunions, and so he's a very precious, uh, beloved cousin to me. Um,